This is a test. This station is conducting a test of the emergency broadcast system. This is only a test. Welcome back, Good News Nation. We are here to finish up our end times discussion and strap in. It's going to get crazy. Indeed. We're, uh, as you probably noticed, we're doing something a little bit different now, format wise, where when we have subjects like this, especially ones where you have a one that could easily fit in a two, two and a half, three hour video, we're going to be releasing it in two parts um, instead of all at once because I know the one of the most common pieces of feedback that I've gotten has been when, you know, take videos and just make them a little shorter mm -hmm. because that's what holds people atten people's attention better. Absolutely. We can't sit down for a five and a half hour movie. Right. You know, and while I personally love when podcasts are two, two and a half hours because I have a lot of time to fill. I know. That doesn't work for a lot of people. They need it for their commute. They, you know, hey, I have this hour lunch break. So we'll try to fit a little better into that. I mean, I'm somebody who I'll sit on YouTube and just listen to lectures mm -hmm. for like three hours. Oh, yes. And I mean, that's something I get a kick out of, but I know I'm in the definite minority on that. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. Same here. So where do you want to start on this end of the discussion? I'm going to leave that up to you. Where, okay, what were we feeding into with uh, where, where we left off? So, we had gone through... We're going to get into some more specifics. Yes. For sure. Yes. Um, honestly, I kind of wouldn't mind if we... Not necessarily a side-by-side -side comparison, mm -hmm. but looking at the Islamic end times prophecy and Christian end or the biblical end times prophecy right. and sort of see, you know, what are their similarities? Where do they sort of diverge? Is there any common ground? Well, in the Bible, for example, two of the two most commonly looked at books are Revelation and Daniel. <clears throat> Had you ever read the book of Daniel before? No. <clears throat> Do you, are you um, vaguely or roughly familiar with the story behind it? He interprets <clears throat> dreams. Right. Daniel was <clears throat> a Jew who was alive during the Babylonian captivity where it was King Nebuchadnezzar reigning over Babylon, which is now uh, Iraq, of course. So Daniel was somebody who <clears throat> the king would call on when he would have a dream, especially if it was one that troubled him, to interpret it. And a lot of the dreams that he had dealt with future geopolitical events, I guess, like, there's one in particular where he says, you know, how is my kingdom going to end? What's going to come after me? And he gives him this dream that talks about uh, a statue or a, a creature who reaches up to the sky made of different metals. And it's smashed, and it covers the entire earth. Um, did you did you come to this part? No. Well, what it's what it's basically getting to is it says that there's a lot of different ways that it's been interpreted, but the most common one is that you know the gold is represented by Nebuchadnezzar. He's saying you know this represents you, and then the one who's going to come after you is going to be Persia, and you know Persia was ruled by an couple of different people. You had Xerxes, you had uh, uh, Cyrus, so on. And then after him was coming uh, Alexander, or the Macedonians period. And Alexander is represented as an eagle because he conquered the world in the shortest length of time. Right? Like, by the time he was 25. Wow. He had conquered the majority of the known world. And then the fourth beast that rises from the sea that's the one that people go back and forth with interpretations on. Like, you know, it talks about a beast rising from the sea um, who have three horns uh, on its head, and then the three horns will fall away when a, a little horn grows from it. 
And if I'm remembering this right, a lot of people have commonly said like this applies to Rome because Rome rose from the sea, you know, like I'd said before, wasn't tied to a piece of land necessarily because, you know, Rome relocated multiple times. But, you know, it was ruled by a triumvirate during the uh, Republic period. And then people have tried to say the Little Horn is the Roman Catholic Church that came after it. Oh, interesting. So, I mean, th- that's one interpretation, but there's like there's millions of interpretations. Mm-hmm. And see, I've heard people go back even further than that and say that, no, what the, the little horn is referred to in another place in the Bible, and it's referring to um, Alexander the Great, and that talking about how the known world was going to be divided up on his death by his different generals... And generally, one of the things that you see is that when when the Bible talks about uh, different beasts with uh, you know multiple heads, multiple crowns, things those are usually referring to empires. Okay. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Like, um, you know, a head could mean the number of different leaders uh, or the number of different provinces or regions that's over and a crown could mean a number of different rulers that are part of it makes sense and so on but it's usually heavily coded political metaphor mm-hmm. in that sense okay that you i mean it it's not really something you can easily interpret in a vacuum you kind of have to go back and look at history to mm-hmm. really make sense of it mm-hmm. you know see what was going on at the time they wrote this stuff so so, on. so daniel in terms of Th- that that was Old Testament? Yeah. And so then you have Revelation, which is New Testament. So you, you've kind of got, I don't want to, you can't call them really bookends, but you, so you've got a little bit of it in the, in the Old Testament, and then you have Revelation in the New Testament. Well, and see, the Bible in and of itself was never originally intended to be one book. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, all of these books were different scrolls. Mm-hmm. And... Then you start to get into semantics of diff- people arguing, okay, well, this scroll was meant to be paired with this scroll, so on and so on. And then in. There was, n- okay, there was never an Old Testament and a New Testament until way, way, way later. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because the because the the Jewish Bible the it, with the Septuagint because yeah. it was like the first five books of the Bible. If, if that's the that's the Torah. The, oh, the Torah. Okay. So, they actually call the Bible the the Jews call the Bible the uh, the Tanak, uh, T A N A K H, and that's almost a history lesson in and of itself because you know in Semitic languages vowels were later additions. Mm-hmm. Um, when you have oral cultures like that, written language w- was really just for the educated class, which really implied just clergy. Mm -hmm. And most of the time, what you would see is just nothing but uh, consonants Mm -hmm. written. And so vowels were something that came way later with, by using dots. Oh. In, you know, different places like, you know, one dot here may indicate, uh, um, you know, an open A or may indicate an O in another place, so on and so on. But... Anyway, what I was getting to is they they were originally just strings of of consonants. And Tannic comes from three three Hebrew words. You have uh, Torah, which is, you know, the first five books. Then you have um, Nevaim, which means uh, prophets. So the order of the books of the Old Testament are different in the Jewish Bible. Oh. Because you, you, so you have the Torah, you have all the prophet books, which is uh, Nevaim, and then you have uh, the K, which is Ketavim, which just means everything else. Huh. Yeah, it literally just means like every other thing that they had, like, you know, uh, Song of Solomon, um, Ecclesiastes, uh, Psalm, like all that. Mm hmm. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. And then, of course, you have all those books that, um, the, like the apocryphal stuff that didn't make the cut. When yeah, I actually have a copy of the apocrypha right here, Ooh. I believe. It's, it, I mean, it's far from a complete one because 
Well, they're still finding some stuff every once in a while, don't they? Like Yeah, occasionally with Dead Sea Scrolls. Yeah. But, se- see, the thing with the Dead Sea Scrolls is seldom do they really find anything truly new. What, what it actually is when you hear people talk about it is there's always been the argument that the Bible has been severely edited over the years. Mm-hmm. For one reason or another, either for um, political interest, for... Um, added emphasis on certain things to match religious interpretations, um, you know, sometimes to accentuate the, the Pope's authority in this world. Just all throughout the ages, you know, it's been edited all over the place. Mm-hmm. And so when the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered in the last century, it was some of the earliest uh, copies of these original scrolls they'd ever found that were dated, you know, pre-AD period. Hmm. So, like I said, they're seldom finding anything new. It's more like, you know, they find a copy of Exodus in scroll form. And so they can go back and look at it and say, okay, this was changed, this was changed, and so on. But a lot of what we call the lost books of the Bible were never truly lost. Mm -hmm. They've always been around. They just haven't been packaged together. Yeah, well... And see, and that in and of itself is a whole other point because what we're talking about is uh, is Western Christianity mm-hmm. that you know uh, people in America have seen mm-hmm. or in Europe have seen and understand. But there's other versions, like for example, the Ethiopian Bible also includes the Book of Enoch, mm-hmm. or um, uh, really a lot of the books that have all been left out. You can find them in a number of different. Uh, number of different schools of Christianity because we may have gone into this before, I can't really remember, but in the time period following the death of Christ, really up until Constantine, for those first three centuries, the major argument among theologians was how to interpret the idea of the nature of Christ. And the Pauline variant, which you know became Western Christianity because it was what Constantine Believed, and there's some ideas that he believed that he was never truly believed it, but he picked this form because it was the closest to paganism, and it was the most capable of uniting the Germanic tribes under mm. one flag. But okay. it talked about the idea that Jesus was literally God in flesh to the point, like I said before, he only appeared human. Mm-hmm. And there's other schools of thought that he was a little bit of mix of both that he had what was called two natures partially divine, partially human. So that's one you see a little bit more in Eastern Christianity where Jesus had a, um, a God nature where he you know, never committed sin, but because he had a human side, he was subject to all the temptations of sin. Like, for example, the writer uh, Nikos, um, I can't think of his last name off the top of my head, but the one who wrote uh, The Last Temptation of Christ that the movie Martin Scorsese did with uh, Marlon, um, not Marlon Brando, uh, Willem Dafoe and Harvey Keitel. You remember that one? I haven't seen it, but I know of it, yes. Yeah, it's based on that one. Oh, okay. Or, you know, the, the Ethiopians, for example, they have always had the idea that Jesus was what you would call the Son of God by adoption, where Jesus was born human, you know, entirely human by human means of conception, but there's a passage where when he's being baptized by John the Baptist, it says that a dove ascends from heaven and enters into his body. And so the Ethiopians interpret that and and believed this was the point where he became the the vessel of God, or got sort of of like possessed and became the the incarnation of the word made flesh is the the terminology they would use. So there... But what what I'm getting at is that ever since the early days of the church, that's always been a big dispute mm-hmm. as to what was the nature of God. And so for that exact reason, certain groups would emphasize other books more than others, and others they would choose to leave out entirely because it didn't fit their interpretation. Mm-hmm. So you really come down with multiple categories. You have some books that are called uh, pseudepigrapha, which are ones that they've never been able to entirely... Um, discern who was the true author of it that they believe it was uh authored by someone else you know back back in the uh the old days 
the idea of authenticity and authorship wasn't the be all end all that it is now, you would have a lot of people who would write text and leave their name out of it completely and attribute it to their teacher. Like an example would be the works of Plato and Socrates. Well, pseudepigraphal books are ones that are kind of like that. Um, like the book of Enoch, they believe wasn't probably written by the actual Enoch. It was written by somebody way later who used the name Enoch. Or that another example would be um, the book of Deuteronomy, how I said it's traditionally attributed to Moses, but Moses dies at the end of the story, so it's safe to assume he really didn't write all of it. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd brought this up to a a religion professor before, and he just kind of like gave me a wink and a nod. He said, Deuteronomy is pseudepigraphal also, but it's left in for, you know, historical reasons. Hmm. So, anyway, uh, Apocrypha is sort of similar. It's ones that, it's not really the authorship that's in question, but it's ones that were left out for one reason or another. And, you know, in some cases, like, like, see, the version I have right here, the table of contents, it has First and Second Esdras, Tobit, Judith, the rest of Esther, Wisdom of Solomon, Ecclesiasticus, uh, Baru- Baruch, or Baruch, who was the epistle of uh, Jeremiah, which was like a scribe, the Song of the Three Holy Children, which is another part of the book of Daniel, Bell and the Dragon, which is a later chapter of Daniel that was originally there, the Prayer of Manasses, and First and Second Maccabees. And there's, there's different reasons why all of them um, didn't make the cut in one way or another. There's, um, there's some versions of this that will also have Psalm 151, because there are only 150 psalms in the Bible, but there's actually probably closer to 155. But 151 is a famous one, but it was left out because they said we can't conclusively prove it was attributed to David in terms of authorship. Uh But, um, like, for example, Maccabees is the story of... Uh, the story of Hanukkah, of how the holiday came about. Uh But it was just left out and became apocrypha because Martin Luther hated Jews. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. So let's let's think about or let's let's talk about revelation. Okay. On on a broad scale, um it's it's full of Image. I mean, the images. Yeah, really themselves. stark, really stark, vivid imagery. Re- really, I mean, I think much more so than anything I've come in contact with as far as the Bible goes. Yeah, I mean, it's it's trippy. Well, I mean, it's it's one of the few passages. It's one of the few books of the Bible that even people who, you know, are atheist or agnostic or anybody reads out of curiosity reasons. Mm-hmm. I mean, it it has such a reputation that's grown over and over the years. Where, like I said, I mean. The interpretation I've come at it from, from uh, reading it multiple times, is that what it's actually talking about is the fall of Rome. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there are people who will wildly and violently disagree with me on that. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, what what are your thoughts on it? I, I, I would be interested to go back and explore it with that in mind um you know because of course i've always come at it from you know oh it's you know this cryptic end times prophecy you know thinking in terms of the future not necessarily our past right you know and so that's that is a real to me that's a very interesting perspective which on the surface, does make a lot of sense to me. Well, and it's it's kind of like I'd said before on the last show how everybody, whether they will admit it or not, even you know unconsciously, everybody kind of wants to believe that they are important enough to where they're going to be alive at the end of the world, or that in a more simple way of saying that the world can't survive without them. I hope I'm not around for the end of the world because I am just not cut out for <laughs> tribulations and I don't know whatever else is going to happen and fires and I don't know locusts or fire brimstone plagues. Yeah, every, not uh, not all about that. And you know, not really sure I want to lay eyes on those four horsemen. Oh. Yeah, yeah. So so let's talk about some of the images that we've got. Okay. So you have the, you, of course, you have the four horsemen. Mm-hmm. You've got the how many headed 
something or another. Um, well, let's see. I'm uh, opening. There's. Is this when uh, the the harlot? Wait. Well, what am I thinking? Re- Revelation. Revelation starts off with letters to to a couple different uh, to a couple different churches, and from there you kind of dive headfirst into this stuff and. John in in the vision is given a book that has seven seals on it and he can't read it or open it but different seals will open and will reveal different visions I guess like for example just the one I came to just to give you an idea of some of the imagery that's in it um, every time a seal's broken a, a trumpet sounds and this was one that we had talked about on a past show about the Manson family. This was one of uh, Charles Manson's favorite ones. But it goes, And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. This is from the King James Version, in case you're wondering why it sounds Shakespearean. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men who have not the seal of God in their foreheads. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months, and their torment was the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it and shall desire to die and death shall flee from them and the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle and on their heads whereas it were crowns like gold and their faces were as the faces of men and they had hair as the hair of women and their teeth were the teeth of lions and they had breastplates as it were breastplates of iron and the sounds of their wings was the sound of chariots of many horses running into battle and they had tails like unto scorpions, and there were tails in, there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. And they had a king over them, which is the king, the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue his name is Apollyon. And I'm not gonna, you know, keep quoting things word for word, but you know that was Manson's mm-hmm. everyone talking because the he bottom. believed it was talking about the Beatles. Yes, yes, and it's interesting because as you were reading that, it was calling to mind some of the stuff that's in the Islamic end times yeah. signs, you know, which I, I thought, like, cause they're, um, one of the, uh, one of the second, some of, so one of the major signs is a huge black cloud of smoke will cover the earth. Right. You know, which that, that basically talked about. Well, when it comes to, Islamic end time prophecies, like one of the things you have to wrap your head around from the outset is how Muslims view both the Jewish and Christian religions. They believe that the Quran is the final correction. It's it's the final prophecy, but it also at the same time they believe it corrects both of them. You know, they believe that the Jews were wrong in the sense that there's no one chosen people by blood, and that Christians were wrong because Jesus was never meant to be worshipped as a human. And so Muslims believe that the Bible has been so heavily edited over the years by different groups for different means that it can't be trusted. Not only edited, but that uh, Jesus Christ was so fundamentally misunderstood, I guess. Like like Muslims believe Jesus was simply a prophet Mm -hmm. rather than a Messiah figure. Uh huh. So, I mean, even though there's some that will call him the Messiah, but the Messiah to the people of Israel. Not yeah. The, not to them. Right. Yeah. So, when it comes to end time prophecy, they believe that all past prophets were given a little bit of information to give to their followers about the end of the world, but only the prophet Muhammad, like, was had the full scoop Mm -hmm. I guess and so that's why you have more stark like vivid detail yeah and that was one of the things I know you had talked about you noticed that it's so in depth 
or so um it's pointed yeah it's it's so um it's explicit yeah and um it's not something you have to debate what does it mean yeah yeah. In, the, in the same way that people will with, you know, the book of Revelation, for example. Yeah, I mean, just, just looking at, at one of these, and and I don't know why this kind of struck me, I don't want to say funny, but it it, it, it kind of did. So, that, you know, it talks about uh, that there will be an Antichrist, which I thought was interesting, too, because I was like, oh, wait, I thought they call we were the, the only ones. They call the Antichrist the, the Massey Ad, Ad Dajjal. Uh, yep. Which, which literally means the... Um, the Messiah of deception is what it roughly means, but the translation is a little bit off with Semitic languages. It Antichrist is kind of like a it's something it, we can relate to. Yeah, it's it's something that people can understand. Yeah, but it's funny because it says um, that the false Messiah shall appear with great powers as a one-eyed man with his right eye blind and deformed like a grape. Like th- that is just so specific. Did it, did you get further than that where it talks about what'll be on his forehead? Uh, or between the eyes? No, it doesn't say that. It between say between the eyes, it'll be three uh, Arabic letters, and it'll be. Uh, uh, I'm trying to think which which letters these exactly are, but it, it'll say uh, the word kafara, which means uh, kafir, or uh, in a broad sense, the word which which means disbelief. Ah. Or uh, not quite atheism, for example, but like, but disbelief. And there's a lot of people who I'm not really gonna like point anybody to on uh, on YouTube because you'll end up like on uh, FBI watch list probably. <laughs> but there's a lot of Muslim end time theologians. Uh, I've watched some of their stuff, and they there's a line of thinking that you see them go into how they noticed how similar this sounds to the dollar bill, the American dollar, the one eye on the pyramid, uh, oh. Novus Ordo Seclorum, uh-huh. uh, Secular New World, and yeah, and how it oh. talks about how the the Dajjal, if you accept him, he'll give you anything you know you want in your wildest dreams, and yeah. Huh. And I also thought it was interesting that they do say that Jesus will come back to kill him, Dajjal. Right. Yeah. Um, which again, and and knowing that, you know, Jerusalem and and the Temple Mount, you know, I mean, that's that's really religi- uh, um important to not well, just the Jews, but all and to the Christians, but also to the Muslims. Well, yeah, they believe that it was the spot where the Prophet Muhammad ascended to uh, heaven and was shown the earth. And Muslims, by and large, I mean, there's there's a lot of debate because, you know, it's wrong to think of Muslims as a hive mind or a monoculture because the, the schisms and the debates within Muslim theology, like Sunni Shia, for mm-hmm. example, are more in-depth and more... Um, more... Uh, I can't think of, uh, can't think of the word. There's a bigger gap between them than we even see in Catholic and Protestant hmm. in Christianity. That really the most the easiest way to understand it would be the difference between Sunni and Shia is almost like Baptist and Mormon. Oh wow! On a theological level, like and then you have groups that are even more different than that and out there. But one of the commonly accepted beliefs in Sunni Islam is that Jesus didn't die on the cross he entered into a state of occultation where he didn't go to heaven he's still present in the world in a hidden form but his assigned uh, task is to come again at the end of times as a military leader oh so so let's see so looking at some of these other ones so we've got um, there's a second blow of the trumpet and the dead return to life so we'll get a little bit of the walking dead uh um, vibe. Mm-hmm. Um, a person passing by a grave might say to another, "I wish it were my abode." Like, I wish I was dead. Yeah, you well, know. Well, well we, we said that. We we talked about this outside and how it's it's broken up into major signs and minor signs mm-hmm. that the that the end times are coming. And my favorite one 
that I thought it was so uh, interesting the way it's worded is it says the full the, the full version of it says liquid gold will be discovered underneath the desert and barefoot Bedouins will compete with each other to build the world's tallest buildings and I I love that one it's so um, relevant I guess yeah yeah it, it really um, and of course you know I mean some of these because the, these are the some of the minor signs um, and and I think again we can look at where we are today because you have um the loss of knowledge and the prevalence of religious ignorance uh increase in pointless killings um one that i did kind of think was funny was widespread acceptance of music (laughs) right um you know but then you have abundance of earthquakes jews fighting muslims when charity becomes a burden um you know people will seek knowledge from misguided and straying scholars you know like you you can really look at some of these things and go well yeah like that's kind of where we are um wild animals will communicate with humans and humans will communicate with objects did you there was one that says well there's a couple that I, i wish i'd written down i've got them in books but there's one that says um a great turmoil will arise in the Maghreb which means North Africa and it will spread in all directions until uh, multiple groups fight for Syria and leave nothing but destruction in its wake which sounds a lot like the Arab Spring Mm -hmm. you know starting in Tunisia then Egypt Libya and finally you know arrived with the Syrian Civil War and then Another one that's just as interesting is it talks about... Th- there's a number of prophecies that talk about the Black Standard rising. Did you come across those? Mm-mm. Well, the Black Standard is a flag, and it was the okay. battle It was the battle flag of the Prophet Muhammad in the early days of Islam. And there's different groups who debate like what the flag looked like, but it's generally accepted there was a b- black flag, and it had the Shahada or the testimony of faith which is you know there's no God but Allah and Muhammad is his uh, his messenger and that's the flag that uh, the Islamic State uses is the black standard but the prophecy says that the black standard will rise in Khorasan which means Afghanistan and it won't be stopped until it reaches Jerusalem and there's other variations of that that say um, the fuse will be lit in uh, Khorasan will burn through Baghdad oh. and won't stop until it reaches Jerusalem. But there's another one that you see a lot of these come from not from the Quran, which is something that always has to be explained is that Islamic uh, theology has two real sources. You have the Quran, which was believed to be channeled by the prophet from Uh, from God through uh, the angel Gabriel. But you also have encyclopedia volumes of what's called Hadith, which just basically translates to traditions, doings, and sayings of the Prophet. So think of the Quran as like things uh, Allah said, and Hadith as things Muhammad said. And a lot of these come from Hadith. So the problem with Hadith, though, is they're divided up into categories from most reliable, where they can trace a literal chain of narration all the way back, you know, for centuries and centuries, versus what you would call weak hadith, which there's either large, large chunks of the chain of narration missing, or, you know, it's just um, debated on. It's, you know, it's seen as, like I said, un- unreliable. Well, there's one that I'm going to have you go over some of the ones that you thought were interesting, but I'm going to pull this up right now. But there's one that I honestly can't find whether this is supposed to be, um, whether this is accepted as weak or uh, a strong one, but it's one that I read that was pretty striking because it sounds like it applies to ISIS. I'm going to pull that one up right now. But go, go over some of the ones that you thought were interesting well this one um 
I think in today's climate, um, <laughs> kind of makes me laugh a little. Uh, so the moon will split in two, but non-believers will we'll insist, insist it, it isn't, isn't happening. happening for real. It's fake news. Yeah. I mean, honestly, I can see it happening. Like, I, I, that's what's kind of, I mean, you know, maybe not talking to animals, but like, I can see like some of this. Yeah. Yeah. We, we would be like, no, 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 no. That's not really happening. It's, it's just your imagination. It's the government trying to feed you a line of bullshit. The moon is not really splitting in two. It's whole. That's, that's CGI. I, I can absolutely see it happening. Well, one of the miracles um, associated with Muhammad was the splitting of the moon. Really? Yeah. Oh. Let me see if I can find that one, come to think of it. So, um, I, I can't find it right now, but there was one um, that said, uh, only the worst people will be left. But then there's another one that says, the leader of a people will, will be, be the, the worst. worst of yeah. them. Oh, my God. Like, th these are, they're, ugh, I don't know. They're, it, they're just so different. A man will obey his wife and disobey his mother. Treat his friend kindly while shunning his father. Stinginess becomes uh, more widespread. Um, well, this one says... In this book of Hadith, it's miracles uh, associated with the Prophet Muhammad, and the Quran is always like considered like the utmost, the like the miracle of the religion because you know it's believed to be channeled rather than written. Uh -huh. <clears throat> but under number two, it says the splitting of the moon narrated uh, Anas that the Meccans requested Allah's messenger to show them a miracle, so he showed them the splitting of the moon. And then put it back together, I guess. Yeah. Because we only have one yeah. that we know of. Right. Huh. So I think I've got this pulled up now. But this was an article that came out, and it was from back in 2015 when ISIS was still all over the news. But I remembered seeing this pop up, and it the title of the article is, Did Prophet Muhammad Warn Us of ISIS? And says it is narrated on the authority of Caliph Ali ibn Abu Talib, who was um, Ali was the fourth caliph after Muhammad's death, and they were cousins. But Ali also married Muhammad's uh, daughter uh, Fatima, who was the father of her children. So he was the founder of uh, Shia Islam, even though both. Groups Sunni and Shia revere him in different ways, but it says it was narrated on the authority of Caliph Ali ibn Abu Talib. May Allah ennoble his countenance. <clears throat> it says, when you see the black flags, then r remain on the ground and do not move your hands or your feet. And the commentary says that tends to just mean don't get involved. But uh, thereafter there shall emerge a weak folk to whom no concern is given. Their hearts will be like the iron rods. They shall be people of the state. Uh, and in parentheses, the little um, reading of that is uh, Ashab al-Dala. They will fulfill neither covenant nor agreement. They will invite to the truth, though they are not from its people. Their names will be with uh, will be Kunyas, which is an uh, Arabic name, where their first name okay it says their first names will be kunyas which begin with abu which means father and their ascriptions or surnames will be to villages or nations such as al masri al harani or al baghdadi oh their hair will be long like that of women and they shall remain so till they differ among themselves and then allah will bring the truth to whomever he wills and in another translation it further brings this up and it says those who fight them will be among the best of creation and those who fight against them and no those who fight against them will be among the best of creation and those who join them will be among the worst of creation hmm so i don't know i just thought that was like a really stark interesting one. and like the thing that not even like the black flag part but, but the thing that kind of interested me was how it said they will be people of the state or ashab al dawla which what's interesting about that is state is a totally western concept it's not something that people in that time would have understood mm -hmm. a meaning to and but like i said i have no idea whether this is a legitimate one or whether this was just something you know um 
an, an apologist made up in recent times to, you know, because y- you'll have things like that in this community, like where, um, th- that's that's the only way I can think to explain it. Like this, wh- whether this is something that actually came from this period and it just you know happens to fit kind of well with present time, or whether this is something that somebody just pulled out of their ass mm-hmm. I, I really have no idea because I, I hadn't been able to find anything like what that traces any kind of chain of narration but it's it's interesting I thought hmm so to me it seems like like I literally don't even know how to verbalize my brain right now <laughs> There, there, there seems to be so in 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 trying to, I guess, do a little mini comparison. The biblical end times is much more on the side of metaphor, metaphor, imagery, and open for interpretation. Oh, absolutely. And I, now, of course, while you, you know you can say the same thing about the Islamic f- uh, philosophies. But it seems more directed, you right? Know, it's it's not like you know, oh, here's a picture and you it, know, yeah, it's not something it's not something you have to interpret really. Yeah, yeah, it's you you may may have to try to make sense of it, but not necessarily interpret it, right? You know, or put your own spin on it. Um, but the the general narrative and the way it it goes down in the stories is that. There will be all these major and minor signs, which we were sort of talking about as to things that were going to happen in the build-up to it, and then the the Dajjal will emerge, which, like I said, will be the, an Antichrist-type figure. But when the Dajjal emerges, it'll be the most difficult test that mankind ever faces for one reason or another. And... There's going to be all kinds of other things that happen. Like there will be uh, a figure called the the Mahdi, which will be like a leader from among the people, who will arise, who was you know predestined to to do this. And that was another thing I thought was interesting about the the Dajjal is how you know, like I'd said, there's some uh, Muslim end time scholars who believe this is talking about the American dollar, but there's others who say no. It says this is a son of Adam. That means it's going to be a human, but one of the descriptions is that he'll be infertile. So, huh. basically, if if you're listening to this and you have children, you're not the Dajjal. Ah, <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, I'm still on the chopping block for that one. <laughs> Damn. So, there's that, and then you're going to have, uh, you know, Jesus is going to return, but... In the Hadith, it says exactly where he'll come back. It says that he will return in Damascus. And they not only say that, he'll return being carried by two angels and will land on a minaret tower of a certain mosque that's right there in Damascus. Wow. And that after that, Jesus will uh, reign as uh, not really a king, reign as a caliph. For years and years after that, and we'll fight the battle against Gog and Magog, who are the two nations they still argue about. Um, Rome will rise in the last days of the end times. Um, Jesus will uh, have children, die, be buried, all this, and then only at the very end uh, there will be uh, a wind. And when it hits, like, everybody will just die. Their soul will just leave their body. And then, then only at the very end um, will the final judgment or the day of judgment take place. And so that's another, as you can kind of tell, that's another one of the schools of thought that you, you see emerge from this is that unlike in the Christian religion where you have the rapture and everything happens at a real bang, bam, boom type pace, Mm -hmm. this is something that stretches for years and years and years. Yeah. And covers a lot of different things. So, 
okay, so 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 thinking about that, so you you have, Je- so you have the Antichrist, you have Jesus coming back, he's going to rule, and then you said Rome is going to rise up. Do you could we interpret that as the Catholic Church, or is it is it more along the lines of uh, an empire the way that Rome used to be? Well, you know, I've I've read in a number of different interpretations for it, but the one that sticks out to me, which I came to myself, and I realize there's there's others that, that share this opinion, is that Rome, on a logical basis, could only be referring to Turkey. Oh, okay. Have, have we ever talked about that or I explained why that is? Um, I feel like we did talk about it a little bit, but just go ahead and give us a brief... Well, it's, it's like I'd said how Rome was something that was never... Um, more than a political construct. Like, when you had a lot of past empires when, you know, they would be uh, taken over or uh, a people would die off, they just ended, right? Mm -hmm. Well, Rome was something that, you know, was named after the city of Rome, but it was an entirely political construct. So after the western part of the empire or the city of Rome fell Constantinople carried on as Rome Mm -hmm. for the next thousand years almost so when we ask well what happened to Constantinople it became Istanbul right? That's a good song (laughs) so was that they might be giants? Uh, I can't remember who that was um, I think so yeah Okay. so when the Ottomans took over Constantinople, they didn't dissolve Rome, they absorbed it. You know, Rome, like I said, even though it was named after the city, it was way more based in North Africa, Anatolia, and the Middle East. Always had been. Because that was where most of the territories were. Mm-hmm. So, when... A lot of people don't even know this, but the crescent moon and the star aren't originally symbols of Islam. They were symbols of Rome. Really? Yeah, way, way back in the early days. And the reason why it was absorbed by the Ottomans is because they were proud of it. They said, we're the third Rome. Oh, wow. Yeah, so the Ottoman Empire, like I said, they didn't dissolve Rome. They absorbed it, all of its titles, all of its symbols, and all of its territories throughout North Africa and the Middle East. Well, the Ottoman Empire survived until, you know, the end of World War One, and... Which, that... Um, can, can I just say, what? That, <laughs> that, that was a hundred years ago. Yeah. Like, I'm sorry, things like Ottoman Empire, Roman... No, that was like centuries ago. That could not have been a hundred years ago. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, I guess a hundred years is a century. There we go. Oh, yeah. But, I mean, like, I'm talking like that. That's ancient history. That's not recent history. Well, you would expect it to be, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, <clears throat> the thing that happened when, when you... You have to ask the question of, well, what happened to the Ottoman Empire? If you're going to figure out what happened to Rome, <clears throat> because Rome has always changed hands by political succession. Uh-huh. So, when the Ottoman Empire became Turkey, present-day Turkey, you had a situation similar to the Soviet Union becoming Russia or Nazi Germany becoming Germany where, you know, yes, it's a different government and it's slightly smaller borders, but it's a political succession. Okay. So, in truth, Rome, on a logical basis, can only mean Turkey. That's really, that's the only thing it can mean. Oh. Because... A lot of people will say, well, what about Italy? And I say, Rome didn't mean Italy Mm -hmm. in ancient times. They'll say, well, what about the the Catholic Church? And I say, the Rome was never defined by its Christianity. Mm -hmm. Because Rome went through numerous periods where it was pagan, where it was later Christian, and you had rulers of Rome who who were Orthodox, who were Muslim, who came from all parts of the world. Everything at different part, times, like late during the empire, which people kind of selectively forget. Mm-hmm. But there's all the there's all kinds of other interpretations too. Well, this well, people will question 
I say, no, it's not Italy. It's not the Roman Catholic Church. They'll say, could this mean all Orthodox nations because of Constantinople? And by proxy Russian, I say, no, that's... You're stretching it and like trying to make it fit a narrative. Mm-hmm. But it's really not. Or they might say, well, what about um, America? Because I guess in their mind they rationalize it to think, well, America's the new Rome. It's the, the empire mm-hmm. of the world. And I say, again, you're stretching a narrative to make it fit your own worldview. Mm-hmm. That in reality, Rome was something that had concrete political succession. All the way through, you had the city-state, then you had Constantinople, then the Ottoman Empire, Turkey. So, mm. in truth, the current ruler of Turkey, Erdogan, is the political successor of Julius Caesar. Wow. Yeah. That's a little mind It's cr- It's crazy to think of it that way, but it's true. Yeah. Very interesting. So, when, it, when something talks about Rome rising in the last days, I mean, I'm not saying that... Oh, gosh, how would I say this? Um, When I say it can't mean anything other than Turkey, I'm saying that if the end times were to happen right now, on a logic basis, it it cannot mean anything other than Turkey. Interesting. Yeah. And see, the questioning what does Rome mean in the end times is a really new school of thought in and of itself when you think about it. Because if you showed this you know, prophecy to people way, you know, the fuck back in the day, they would, and you'd say, well, what do you think this means, Rome? They'd say, what do you mean? It means Rome. Yeah, yeah, it was just a given for them. Yeah, you you, you didn't have to do all this guesswork with it, or, you know, even, you know, how, how like I said, Constantinople was just called Rome. Mm-hmm. And they would say, well, clearly this means Rome. It means the, the Roman Empire rising. But when you start going through political successions and having things dissolve, um, it becomes a little more convoluted. Yeah, it, it, it becomes it becomes something you have to put a little bit of uh, historical context to mm-hmm. to really understand it. Yeah. But no, that's that's what it's talking about. Like that's the long and short story I could give you is that the, that Rome in the last days means Turkey. So. It almost seems, and, and this is probably very simplistic, but it almost seems like the Islamic end times really kind of brings some of the religions to, like the world religions. I don't want to say together, mm. but there there's a a confluence, you know, that you you've got Jesus coming back and he's gonna you know take out the bad guy and then he's gonna rule for a while and then what also says he's going to destroy every cross and kill every pig well yeah hmm <laughs> so yep which maybe the way, not yeah which the way they interpret that is meaning <clears throat> that he's going to like set the record straight and say I was never meant to be worshipped ah okay boy that would and that by killing every pig that was Killing every pig is a common expression. Um, I mean, not in this part of the world or anything, but meaning there's going to be no question as to what the law of God is, I guess. That it's going to be something ever-present in everybody's life. So where pig, for example, is something that's forbidden Mm -hmm. and outlawed, it doesn't mean literally going to, like, murder every pig. Yeah. But it's, it's a... It's a euphemism. Mm-hmm. It's a form of speaking that means like there's no longer going to be like a question yeah. as to a destruction of previous beliefs or right. There's only there's only going to be one religion. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. That that's one of the things. Like, I in a religion class I'd taken, there was a professor who was explaining that about the um, the first uh, the first surah of the uh, of the Quran, which is the the seven line prayer that uh, you know is prayed five times a day and the fourth line of it uh, translates the the literal term, term, terminology used is uh, Maliki Yalmadin which means uh, Malik is the Arabic word for king and it roughly translates in English to master of the day of judgment referring to to God which means that it's a more complex phrase than you think on the surface because 
the implication of it is that on the the in it, that in the end times there's only going to be one religion, mm-hmm. and it goes back to like you know what I was saying about how the euphemism of killing every pig, yeah, is but yeah, um, but so I guess a thing to kind of get into is that you know how we brought up a couple times how with Muslim end time prophecy it's very cut and dry as far as there's not it doesn't leave a lot of room for guesswork but with a thing i kind of want to get into is with with current christianity and some of the the most common uh current interpretations that you see um in times theologians and uh, bible scholars and preachers making now and the the big one that most uh, oh gosh the big one uh, currently that most of it is uh, is formulated around <clears throat> all centers around uh, Israel rising again or the Jews returning to Israel because there's a passage that talks about when the Jews return to uh, to the promised land it will only be a generation before the return of Christ so here's the thing about that is that in this is okay this is where you get into mental gymnastics I can see the the look on your face yep <laughs> yeah this is where you start really having to you know um, you gotta think figure, it through. You, you you have to ask. Well, the natural question that comes from it was is how long is a generation supposed to be? Mm-hmm. And the answer is that in the Old Testament, a generation was commonly uh, taken to mean seventy years. Okay, roughly. So when you apply it to that, there was a lot of people who looked at it and said, "Okay, Israel's formed in 1946. So if it's only going to be a generation." then that would put us at 2016 mm-hmm. maximum. We're late. Yeah. So when it didn't happen in 2016, they started saying, okay, well, what about 1948? You know, there was something, you know... Because you, you, I'd always, in my head, had 48 as the year that yeah that Israel became. Yeah. So you have 48. That puts you at 2018 We're maximum. Late. Yeah. Again. <laughs> so... So the newest one is... So... The newest one is they start saying, well, maybe it's 1967 when they took Jerusalem. And you had the um, you had the annexation with the West Bank and Gaza. Okay. So, so that would put you at 2037. Seven? Yeah. Okay. 2037 maximum time. But then you start having to go, well, maybe it's some other point mm-hmm. that we're not even sure of yet. Maybe it's... Maybe it you, hasn't happened yet. Yeah, maybe the start hasn't even occurred yet. Maybe they're talking... See, there's a lot of Orthodox Jews that say it can only be talking about when the the Dome of the Rock is destroyed and the Second Temple is rebuilt and we bring back uh, animal sacrifices. Yikes. That that's when it will fully begin and that's when the 70 years will start. So... You can play mental gymnastics with it all day and say, well, maybe it's this, maybe it's this. But that is the current true um, cornerstone or pillar to Christian end-time prophecy is it all centers around Israel right now. So it's either 2037 or we have no fucking clue. Right. Got it. Well, or any time before 2037 because... What it says is it will be no more than a oh, generation. Oh, no more than... Yes, so sometime between now and forever... This might happen. Right. My favorite kind of stuff between now and forever. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, there. but there's three sites right there in Jerusalem that, you know, all three of the religions uh, put a, you know, shitload of importance on for, the, for a euphemism there. But you've got the Church of the Holy Sepulchre for Christianity. You have Al-Aqsa Mosque and you have the... The Western Wall? Yeah. And see, like, that's something, and th- th- that's definitely something for another discussion, because I feel like it, it could really go on for a while, is how you have three of the world's religions 
I don't want to say fighting over the small, this tiny little plot of land, but I mean, there, there's, Jersey. The, there's this significance for three of the world's religions in this one small space, like that. Well, in Islam, Jerusalem's the third holiest site. Uh, Mecca is the first, and Medina's the second, mm-hmm. and Jerusalem's the third. But no, you're you're absolutely right. Jerusalem is um, a holy site to all of them. And, and I, I've always found that so fascinating. Yeah, you know that that it's like that. So, and maybe someday we'll we'll discuss that. Well, there's there's a belief within within Zionism to like keep going back to that term, but how you know there there was a quote by the this rabbi um, in the article who said Zionism isn't something that is uh, is an earthly way of thinking. It's mystical, mm-hmm. and that when you divorce it from its mystical nature. You're, you essentially cut off from it. It's not something that can be rationally understood. It goes back to, you know, the covenant God made with Abraham. And so within Zionism, there's the belief that Israel's entitled to all of Lebanon and Jordan, but also most of Syria, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, and Egypt. So... It'd be an empire in and of itself. Yeah. Wow. Huh. But... Um, that's that's the thing I keep coming back to is when talking about Zionism is how you know it's I remember during the 2016 elections there was a lot of uh, joking that happened online where when they were announcing candidates and they were coming up on stage one of the questions that a candidate had to answer before they were going to have any chance of getting an endorsement from the get go was do you pledge your undying support to Israel and people were joking about that, saying that's so that's so odd when you really get down and think about it. That to be president of a country, you have to pledge allegiance to another country before you're going to get your party's endorsement. Mm-hmm. And that's and so things like that, you know, that that have gone on since Reagan and probably you know roughly before, because that was really one of Falwell's biggest. Achievements and where you saw the transition was not just with Reagan, but he was the man who turned Jesse Helms from being a raging anti Semite to a militant pro Zionist overnight just by, you know, having him go through a religious conversion to and this I, stuff. I, I have a, I don't want to say a special place in my heart for Jesse Helms, but <laughs> uh, so I went to wing it. Uh-huh. And he was a humongous supporter of the school that I attended, okay. and you know, and we have the Jesse Helms Center, and it's right across from campus, and you know, so it's it was one of those things when I saw his name in the article, I was like, what? Yeah, I was like, oh my, okay, yeah. oh yeah, yeah. So, so with um, I'm trying to think where I was going with this. With there's always been. You, you know, you know when you see things like that, like I was talking about with the the presidential debates and who was going to get the party nomination, because of how odd that seems on the surface, that always gives rise to this. I don't want to say school of thought, but this speculation. Uh, this speculation of you know you you go and throw back to the the trope over and over again of like uh, there's. Jews or Zionists that are running this shadow government mm-hmm. for America and that, you know, the American leaders are puppets of, of Israel and all this. Mm-hmm. But, like I said, the thing I use to counter that is that, you know, I'm not going to deny Israel has a massive lobby in Washington, D.C., but those guys are outnumbered vastly mm-hmm. by just regular white Christians who are obsessed with this Jerry Falwell school of thinking. Yeah, and it, I mean, and you had said earlier that you know they're they're trying to sort of usher in this this period, and that that's why they're you know they're they they see themselves as the protector of Israel because then if they do that, then that ushers in this next that grants them a place in paradise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it it makes sense when you think of it in those terms. And I think it was Jimmy Swagger. It was either him or Jim Baker who actually said it, which, which funny enough, Jim Baker's back on TV. You knew that, right? Oh, no. Oh, yeah, he's selling uh, uh, doomsday supplies. Oh, sweet lord. For like a a food hoarding 
and uh, like ba basically like a uh, lock boxes and kits that you can store uh, canned food in. So yeah, he's on late night TV now. Oh boy. Yeah. I'm glad I don't watch late night TV. Yeah, oh, yeah, he's back. Um, I can't remember if it was Jim Baker or Jimmy Swagger though that had this. And it, you know, now the more I think about, it, I'm I'm almost tempted to say I think it might have been Pat Robertson, but. Whoever it was, it almost like really doesn't even matter. But he yeah. said that if Israel was God's chosen people, America is God's almost chosen people. Oh, that America's oh. like you know the second place. I mean, close only counts in horseshoes and hand grenades. I oh wow. Yeah. Th hmm. Have you ever now? Now here's a question: Have you ever run across any Jewish end time prophecy? No. No. N not that I'm aware of. Yeah. Is there any? It's um It's a complicated subject. Oh. There was one thing I came across. See, a lot of it seems to be relegated to people who follow uh, Kabbalah and mystic schools that okay. you know, and it comes in the form of sacred numerology and like deciphering years with that, but the most interesting piece of Jewish uh, end time, and it's not even really end time prophecy, it's just speculation based on sacred numerology, but it had to do <clears throat> with the year 2018. And 2018 is the starting point, but roughly like a five year window between 2018 and 2022. And it's based off of the number 5,788 which is a mystic number, they believe that between... that that was the number of years between when Moses revealed the Torah. So it was like humankind's like um, initiation into learning the nature of God versus when the cycle ends. And that, that puts it somewhere between 2018 and 2022. And that the way it talks about it is it says that this will be when mankind will meet the face of its destroyer for the first time. Not that it will be destroyed right away or that, you know, destruction is imminent, uh -huh. but just that it will be when mankind will meet its destroyer for the first time. And this, w and that the way this is going to line up is it corresponds with humanity collectively coming together, you know, for a moment and, like, uh, having peace and, like, marveling at our greatest creation. And that the destroyer will be something that's not an external outside force, but something that was with us all along. Implying something we create. And the way it sounds to me, and the way like a lot of other people seem to interpret it, is that it means AI. That's exactly what I had in my head. I was like, oh my god, the robots are coming for us! I know, it's, it's pretty fucking crazy. That literally just gave me chills and willies at the same time and I don't like that. Well, I heard a rabbi Ooh. talk about it on YouTube. If I can dig up the video, I'll attach it as a link. But he talks about this and how, you know, because of the mystic number, um, I'm wanting to say it's 5,788. It could have been... It's it's right there in that territory. But he says that it it has to be like this that it was always going to be like this because it's ordained within, you know, uh, numerology. It's it's written in the code. And, you know, this, it's part of, like, he starts expounding on talking about how, you know, the whole school of thought where when that science isn't man so much making discoveries as it is unveiling <clears throat> the, uh, the thumbprints of God. Oh. That... Does that make sense to yeah. you that, that science is just like revealing the blueprint for the laws of creation within the parameters of the universe, I guess? And the way he, the way this rabbi explained it, I thought it was really interesting. He said that man is nowhere near as powerful as he thinks he is against things that are preordained because he goes, man can do a lot of things. Man can, you know, change the surface temperature of the earth a few degrees one way or direction or another, but one thing he can't do is change a single digit of pie. And that, like, floored me when I heard that. Like, I, I love that, uh, wow. that phrase. That, that, I mean... That, that was, like, so profound, I thought. Yeah. I, I mean, you could really kind of chew on that for a while. And, you know, the, that's, that's kind of something 
that I've that I've always thought, you know, there, there's the whole argument or the whole conflict between, you know, science and, and creationism or, or you have evolution and creationism right. and you know, so, so you have this thing and I've always seen them as the same. Yeah. You know, that that there is a creator, God or Allah or what whatever name you give to the creator, there is this being this this entity that is created us and also the dinosaurs and also Neanderthals and you mm-hmm. know all of these other things throughout the millennia but I don't I don't like to me I don't see the two things as being in conflict with each other that we were created but yet we discover things we create things ourselves you know and and that I, I well, really that's kind something, of like that that's something that when you really like start studying theology I mean I know we're like kind of drifting <clears throat> but when you when you really read into this stuff and study it you'll find that that's a common theme in all three of the religions like for example one of the things that it talks about in uh, Islam is it says that the first thing that was invented uh, or created <clears throat> by uh, by God was a pen and the first action he did was create a book of writing everything that was ever going to happen and then writing a book of everything that was ever not going to happen and this is I mean it's that's like poetic euphemism for saying that not so much fate or well I mean I guess it kind of is like there's nothing that happens that that isn't written but you know the idea of um everything being written everything that's ever going to happen being written and everything that's not going to happen which is what uh, some occultists call the uh, the Akashic Records oh but, okay yes I've heard that yeah is that there's um, I guess that science and theology or that science and the realm of God aren't necessarily separate does that make sense to yeah. you? Like that, when when a person, I, I can't remember who it was that originally made the the quote that talked about the first uh, drink of the glass of uh, when a person first drinks of the glass of uh, science, they become an atheist. But at the bottom of the glass, they find God. Hmm. That yeah, it's. I mean, that's interesting. Yeah, I'm I'm losing my train of thought here, but. I think that's kind of what it keeps trying to hound at is that they're not necessarily mutually exclusive. Right. Yeah. And I I would I would agree with that. Yeah, that when a person when a person studies science that and and you know people forget that because you know in America we're used to thinking of them as very separate things because of you know the church's uh backlash against Darwin mm-hmm. and so on and Religion became to be seen as like you know the refuge for um, reactionaries against science, mm-hmm. but you know people kind of forget that in the early days, or not really in the early days, but in the Middle Ages, um, the church were the biggest funders of science. Mm-hmm. You yeah. know, all, all those guys like Galileo and Copernicus, the, the church were the ones who financially funded them, and it was backed off of that idea that. When a person discovers science, they're not disproving God. They're finding the the blueprint mm-hmm. for the universe. So, I don't know. That's just... Well, maybe someday, and God, I hope it's not AI, maybe someday somebody will discover the blueprint for end times. Maybe. So, what do you think? Are we in the end times? Are we ever not in the end times? <laughs> I, I mean, I kind of feel like it. about all of these could about fit with every decade of my life. You yeah. know, I... Yeah. I, I wouldn't disagree with that statement, you know, that we are always in the end times. Yeah. You know, and... No, I, I, I absolutely believe that because, you know, it's, and it's like I said, whether you believe this stuff or not, it's kind of irrelevant. Yep. Because... 
like I said at the outset, the people who run the world, they absolutely believe it. They have a vested interest in at least seeing it set up Mm -hmm. to happen. And they really, they've shown they really don't mind killing a lot of people to set the stage for it, if that's what it calls for. And, you know, it doesn't, and it doesn't even have to come from uh, religion. If you believe in, uh, if you believe in climate change, if you believe we're going headfirst to nuclear war, if you think overpopulation and famines going to kill the planet, I mean, we, I mean, the, the end times are not something that's distant. Yeah. They're always right around the corner, depending on one move of the chessboard. Mm-hmm. Yep. So, well, I mean, what about you? Yeah, that's, I, I kind of believe, you know... I feel like we've probably been here for a very, very long time. Longer than maybe anybody really wants to admit or or to realize. Um, I do really hope I'm not here. Um, I'm I'm not strong enough for that. Um, And I also think that you can interpret anything to be a sign of the end times. Oh, yeah. So I feel like this is a debate this is a, a fascination well, it's like the, that it's will like never the, end. It's like the JFK Jr. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Dang, I mean, that that's, that to me is the, the ultimate encapsulation of it. Because you could totally read that passage and say, oh gosh, it says right here in June, July 1999 that the uncrowned son of the king is going to fall from the sky. Oh my God, that means JFK Jr. Yep. I mean, there's people who believe that, but at the same time, I look at it and go, I mean, you know, like I said, maybe to some people, but to to a lot of other people, he's just some dude. Yep. So, no, I mean, you you can interpret that stuff all kinds of ways. And we will continue to do that for probably more millennia than we can fathom are out there. No doubt. (laughs) Well... I don't know, that that remains to be seen. Uh, you know, one of the things I, I say a lot, and I'm really not even joking when I say this, is anytime climate change gets brought up, I'm like, you know what? I have a feeling AI is going to do us in way before the weather does. Yeah, that really scares me. I really, I can't think about it. I can't, I can't, I can't. I won't until I do. Yeah. And on that note, I say we bring the end times discussion to a close. Any All right. final thoughts? No. Yeah. That's, no, no final thoughts. That's a huge package that we just unleashed. Yep. Well, thank you guys for joining us. We will be back in a couple of weeks. We're going to keep our next topic a secret for just a little longer, but uh, maybe we'll post some thoughts and hints and some ideas. Spoilers. And spoilers. We like spoilers. You'll love it. So, for the Good News Nation, this is Kara Hayes and Reverend Doctor signing off. We'll see you soon. This is a test of the emergency broadcast system. The broadcasters of your area, in voluntary cooperation with the FCC and other authorities, have developed this system to keep you informed in the event of an emergency. If this had been an actual emergency, you would have been instructed where to tune in your area for news and official information. This concludes this test of the emergency broadcast system.